Well, uh, I will start with an anecdote. I'm at the moment, at present, I am a, a visiting scholar at the Humboldt University in Berlin. And when you enter the building uh, on Unter den Linden, in the main hall, the first thing that you notice will be uh, uh, something which is written on the wall. And it is the famous 11th thesis on Feuerbach by Karl Marx, which says more or less, Till now, philosophers have interpreted in different way the word, now it's time to change it. I think this could be a good starting point uh, for two reasons. First, philosophers as interpreters. I think that uh, uh, philosophy, contrary to scientific theories, uh, doesn't tell us, doesn't describe the word, but it gives an interpretation of the word. In other terms, uh, while scientific theories can be uh, considered to be true or false, right or wrong, according to the to their correspondence to the f to facts, I mean uh, we don't we won't start another discussion about what it means to be true uh, a true scientific theory, Popper and so on. So uh, just roughly, yeah? in the case of a philosophical theory, you wouldn't say that it is true or false uh, because it. It is not a description of the word as it is. It is a reading of the word, so an interpretation of the word. So uh, you can say that the theory is more or less adequate uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, to a certain context. Um, for instance, we are here to speak about uh, Kant's philosophy of law and of the state. And uh, you may I ask, for instance, uh, whether this theory, whether uh, Kantian, the Kant's theory of uh, law and the state uh, is adequate to grasp, to understand uh, our world, that is what right, what law has become nowadays, what the state is uh, at, the, at present. And the answer uh, would be, in a sense, uh, well, complex, or uh, in a sense, yes, in a sense, no, uh, sort of uh, uh, vulgar dialectic, if you want, uh, in which sense it is not, not adequate, uh, because Kant is not thinking of this, uh, when he describes what it describes, uh, when it, he gives his interpretation of the state, he's thinking of something which is not our state. Or uh, when Kant tried to think about international relations, the word he's describing is not our globalized world. They, uh, the problems he's trying to solve are different, uh, uh, are not our problems, uh, like for instance uh, global, uh, global climate change or ecological problems or migration and so on. This is, these are problems that Kant can't uh, think of, of course. On the other side, uh, when you study Kant's uh, philosophy of law and of the state, you don't do it in order to find their the solution. Like you know, okay, this is the this is the solution. We just take it and we apply it. Uh, you do it to seek for inspiration. So you want what you want to do is to see whether Kant's way of thinking, the problem of his time, uh, if this way of thinking, the problem of his time can be something that we can adopt. That is, we, can we think of the problems of our world in a Kantian way? That doesn't mean uh, that we take the doctrine of law, the, the book we are discussing mostly in this Congress, and we just uh, adopt it as a way of uh, understanding uh, uh, our legal order, for instance. You know? But we can really try to learn from Kant or from any other thinkers of the past, uh, how to understand the word. Well, maybe this is a very Hegelian way of thinking because, you know, Hegel uh, uh, defined philosophy more or less like this grasping uh, one owns times uh, in concepts. Uh, uh, this is not what Kant say, uh, but in a sense, uh, this is what Kant does. And this is precisely what I think we could do. So this word, this would be the philosophers have till now interpreted the word. 
Now the second part. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to change it. How can a philosopher change the world? Uh, again, he can and he can't. Uh, I mean, uh, the first answer could be a very direct way, uh, just engaging politically. But in this case, it is not the philosopher. Who is the philosopher who is changing the world is just a citizen. I mean, if I start uh, a political action, a protest, for instance, or if I candidate for a political office, I'm doing this as a citizen, not as a philosopher. So what do I do as a philosopher? I try to give an interpretation of reality and to offer it to the public. Uh, and we come back to Kant. Uh, Kant stress out in his... Uh, uh, in certain writings, particularly in a writing called uh, Answer to the Question What is uh, Enlightenment, he stress out this uh, um, task of not only of the philosopher, uh, he's, he's, he used the word gelerte, I mean, everyday people, intellectuals, we would say nowadays. Uh, and this task is precisely to bring certain themes, certain uh, arguments to, uh, to the public, uh, to start discussions about these questions, to take openly position. Uh, and so normally when you uh, think uh, about a contemporary philosopher, you will think about someone who at the same time has a chair, is a philosophy professor, because uh, Nowadays, philosophers are mostly uh, uh, professional philosophers, but that means nothing else than professor of philosophy. So in this sense, you have a double task. Uh, you have the task as an intellectual to speak loud uh, uh, in the world, for instance, through newspapers, uh, or like now, for instance, giving interviews and so on, taking so a position in a wider arena in a wider sphere but you have also the other task of being uh, uh, of uh, of uh, bringing certain themes or certain topics uh, into your activity as a teacher that doesn't mean to indoctrinate the, 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 the students that would be very bad uh, on the contrary what do you do as a what do you are supposed to do at least as a professor of philosophy is not to teach the, the right or true philosophy, because as we saw, there is no, nothing uh, like that. But you want to uh, uh, bring the students to develop, to make them develop uh, a critical attitude. Critical not in the sense that they have to criticize the world. They, can, they may also uh, defend the status quo. They may say, oh, this is the, better, the best possible world. So, as allegedly Leibniz uh, said, which is not exactly what he said, but anyway, um, this is not the point. The point is, they may also defend the status quo, but they have to do it because they think that it is a just word. Or, on the contrary, they have to criticize it if they think that they, it is an unjust word. But they have to come to think about it. And the question is, how do you think about it? How do you, where do you find the tools to think about the world, to grasp the world? And the professor of philosophy normally make a, a work of, uh, how can I say, of uh, mediation. He's mediating between the positions of classical philosophers and the students. Uh, so our debate about Kant is actually a debate about theoretical, intellectual tools through which we could understand the world. And uh, so this is a way of doing, uh, of changing the world because, uh, again, uh, a philosopher has only this, uh, this uh, instrument, which is uh, the pen, as they said before, yeah? or the feather. And it is a powerful instrument. And this is precisely what also Marx thought. I mean, Marx really thought, if you criticize uh, reality, you are already changing reality because you are showing what reality is, really.
to do say you know, beyond the veil of ideology and so on and so on. But uh, in a sense, uh, what I was uh, saying is right. So again, we go back to the classical philosophers because we want to understand the world. But of course, sometimes we have to uh, to say, well, he's helping me to this point, but not over this point. For instance, if you want to grasp capitalism, it is good still to read Marx. But if you want to understand con contemporary financial capitalism and so on, maybe you should read also other authors, you know, uh, 